evening, everyone, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I am Amit Saxena, along with my colleague, Dr. Deepika Chabra from Medical Services. On behalf of Jackson Power Pharmaceuticals Limited, Pharma Division, would like to extend warm welcome to this sixth episode of Cephom web series, Quality of Life Issues on Mars, Genitourinary Syndromes of Menopause, Her unspoken, unspoken Problem, with academic partner, Jackson Power Pharmaceuticals, smlm.in. Jackson Power Pharmaceuticals Limited offers you Lycorid, Verena Gel, and Divatron. Lycorid soft gel, which one found to be very useful to correct nutritional deficiencies. It contains lycomato lycopene, served to enhance general health and well-being. A warm and hearty welcome to all esteemed faculty and attendees. Dear attendees, if you have any questions, suggestions, clarifications, please post it in the Q&A box or chat box. We shall also enable audio of attendees to speak up and make this webinar more interactive. So please raise your hands if you want to speak up. And please note this webinar is streaming live on Facebook. The link is already being shared on the chat box for you to circulate to in your WhatsApp groups. To refer this webinar in recording in future, please visit our YouTube channel, Jackson Paul Medical Insights. Now we introduce Dr. Marinder Auja. Dr. Marinder Auja, the convener of this web series. Dr. Marinder Auja, ma'am, a progressive thought-provoking leader has created progresses of going digital, online voting, e-news letters, online journals. She is president of CEFORMS, founder president, uh, uh, president, uh, president of SMLM, past president, Indian Menopause Society, FOGS, vice president, CEFORMS, executive member of many societies dealing with health of women like ISAR, IFS, ISPART, NARCHI. She is the editor in chief of Journal of Midlife Health. And she has been felicitated many awards and has many publications and research papers to her credit. Now I'll just introduce Dr. Rinda Major, Madam. So please kindly initiate this proceeding, ma'am. Thank you, Amit, for the kind words and the words of introduction. And uh, it's in my honor to welcome all our guests, our faculty from the five countries of South Asian Federation of Menopause Society. Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and India. And uh, we have been working together like a family. And this family has been growing by leaps and bounds. And that's very heartening to see each and everyone participating from all the countries in these webinars and very enthusiastically. And what the changes we have brought is we are inviting the younger generation also to take participate along with the senior faculty who are the guiding force for all these things. Please unmute Dr. Zinnat, Dr. Saida Mazar, uh, and uh, Dr. Suraya Rahman. Uh, Dr. Saida, a very, very active participant of the uh, forms and in her local uh, menopause societies of the Pakistan and gynecological societies of Pakistan also. So Professor Saida Batul Mazar, we invite you to say a few words for this webinar series and this webinar in particular on genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Malinda, for inviting us uh, and uh, arranging these regular seminars. It has been fantastic. I think we've become very good friends and we've yeah. learned a lot about menopause together. So uh, I, I would like to thank you for arranging this. And I think this is a very hot topic, GSM, and a very neglected one, especially in the South Asian region, because women are very hesitant to talk about it. And in Pakistan, we don't seem to have enough preparations to uh, manage it. In some countries, they are available. Uh, so we, we are very uh, limited by the amount of... Uh, local preparations which is uh it is a bit of a heartbreaking thing and not much is being imported either so that remains a problem but i think we can learn a lot and there's a lot of everything is not hormones there are so many other things to manage so thank you so much maninder and i hope we learn a lot during this session so we have the moderator for this panel which is dr maninder ahuja and with her are the 
co uh, moderator is professor alia bashir ma'am would you like to take it up from here dr uh, alia bashir just introduce her uh, i really honored to have professor alia bashir as my co moderator and uh, <clears throat> she is the um, mbbs dgo mcps fcp mhp master in health professional education and fellow in aesthetic gynecology also that's good because we are having that topic also author of two books and co authors of two books and researcher more than 25 publication in national and international journals chairperson of obstetric and gynecological committee uhs uh, lahore and life member of sogp finance secretary of lahore sogp organizer of many courses and examiner of uh, uhs and cpsp and ex director qc sims lahore and chairperson research grant board alama iqbal medical college patron punjab club alama iqbal medical college uh, professor alia bashir it's a honor to have you here as a co moderator and uh, i'm really thankful to uh, dr saida batul uh, professor saida batul also for suggesting your name also next we have our panelists from one from each country and uh, from islamabad pakistan we have dr humaira noreen who is the associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology in rawalpindi medical university rawalpindi pakistan and member of the pakistan menopa society member of pakistani uro gynecological association lifetime member of society of obstetrician and gynecological of pakistan section editor of journal of rawalpindi medical college approved instructor for also provider course and chief organizer of diploma in obstetrics and gynecology program uh, rmur and supervisor of ms fcps and dgo program and examiner for ms dgo imm and fcps examination conducted by the rmpr cpsp welcome dr humaira nouri and her talk will be on the hist um, pathophysiology of gsm thank you madam from uh, we have professor chanil ekanayake uh, who is the consultant obstetrician and gynecologist um, and from sri lanka and she is the general sir john kotlawala defense university chairman academic activities menopaus society of sri lanka 2022 to present and she is the council member he is the sorry he is the council member of sri lanka college of obstetrician and gynecologists from 2022 to present uh, welcome professor chani lekanayake next when we are coming with the panel we'll be giving their topics also and we have from uh, nepal dr tarun pradhan and he is the professor department of obstetrics and gynecology of birat medical college teaching hospital kathmandu university and uh, professional membership and association life member of nepal society of obstetrics and gynecology life member of nepal medical association member of international uro gynecological society academic committee co chair south asian federation of uro gynecology editorial board member in birat journal of health sciences editor in open access journal of gynecology and editorial member of nepal journal of obstetrics and gynecology there are many awards to his name international continent uh, continent society clinical fellowship award 2014 and nepal society of obstetrics and gynecology award 2017 welcome dr tarun pradhan our next speaker is dr Jena, uh, 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 hormonal treatment will be taken by dr sohili nargis and she is the assistant professor kumudni women's medical college publications secretary ogsb tangal branch tangal branch Bang bangladesh welcome sohili nargis she is much beautiful than her in photograph here and then we have dr rimi singla from india and she is diploma in reproductive medicine and um, mbbs dgo fcog mrcog part 1 designation is she is the director of the radiance hospital and test tube baby center radiance hospital mohali punjab medical director of the singla mediclinic laparoscopic fertility and gynec ward vice president of the mohali obstetrics and gynec society and treasurer of isar chandigarh and founder secretary of mohali obstetrics and gynecological society she is a very very active person and chairperson of the disha women welfare trust she has been awarded by the 
पंजाब गवर्नमेंट हर एकेडमिक कंट्रीब्यूशन फॉर द लेप्रोस्कोपिक एंड द इनफर्टिलिटी सर्विसेज and uh, she was the rashtriya swam uh, swarnim in the award 2019 in the field of medicine and health by women power society india awarded the best ivs specialist punjab international healthcare awards awarded for her contribution in the field of ivf infertility india iconic awards and awarded by his Ex excellency shri vp singh badnor governor punjab to services of the childless couples ivf services and awarded with disha women award 2018 by honorable minister of health and family uh, welfare punjab uh, the main reason why i have invited her because she has been actually doing the reconstructive gynecology or the um, cosmetic gynecology or the energy sources which are being used in the gynecological practice so she has uh, preparing her paper also and she has a good collection of about 200 cases already to her credit so we'll be hearing from her at the last uh, topic uh, energy sources in the genital urinary syndrome of menopause ya yeah, pushpa welcome to you <laughs> she is the president of present president of indian menopause society and senior practicing obstetrics and gynecology at gurgaon director sethi hospital and uh, organizing chairperson of amscon 2018 vice president of indian menopause society from 2021 to 22 she has been very very active member of many many societies special chairperson club 35 plus midlife management committee of foxy also 2015 to 2018 past executive member of uh, she was council of reforms also past patron of ima gurgaon and past president gurgaon of static gani society she is with the past president of ima also but she is with the thalassemia society also and she is with the uh, lions club uh, and rotary clubs also working on various project and she actually made available one mobile van for the um, uh, door to door services or village to village services provided for breast cancer screening and cervical cancer screening also so pushpa it's a honor to get have you here and i think GS, gsm genital urinary syndrome of menopause is one of the uh, very favorite topics i have so we would like you to say a few words on this pushpa welcome to you thank you so much for having me here and when i saw the topic uh, i was really uh, you know very impressed because just gave the talk on this very topic uh, at faridabad few days back yeah. but you were i was seeing that every part has been taken up separately so it's going to be very very interesting to uh, to hear a full lecture on pathophysiology a full lecture on hormonal therapy a full lecture on non hormonal therapy anita you are doing excellent work in cefoms in your own midlife uh, you know the midlife health management uh, committee in the society that you have and uh, all the best for the uh, evening webinar today and uh, such great uh, participants from all over the cefoms countries a very good evening to all of you and have a great great webinar uh, looking forward to listening to in detail about uh, all the different aspects of gsf thank you so much without wasting much time we have been having these webinar series which are on the menopause rating scale and in between we had the webinars with british um, bangladesh menopause society also pakistan menopause society and sri, sri lanka also held some webinars and um, physical conferences also and uh, these webinars were starting with the, this menopause cefoms awareness webinar was with the menopause society of sri lanka and then this was the metabolic syndrome which we had taken in the 10th may 2022 that was the last year but this year we have started taking from the 16th march hot flushes and then and see all the members from all the countries are there present at the different uh, guest of honors and everybody is involved there so 13th april sleep and midlife quality of life disorders and then we had the um, uh, mood and anxiety and irritability on 18th may and in the june we had uh, sexuality in midlife on the 13th july june we were not having any webinar and then we had the uh, august we had on um, joint and muscular problems 
and now we are having this GSM and later on we will be having urinary problem and risk assessment tools that will be November and December. So this topic now is GSM, genitourinary syndrome of menopause, her unspoken problem and they are unspoken in reality like Dr. Saida Batul also highlighted that very few women come and complain and we just have to find out those women whenever they come with some other complaints also perhaps we have to take them out of their cupboard and start talking to them so like they will they might come to you with dryness of in uh, vagina or increased disease but most of the time they are very hesitant when they enter your clinic and they will want to hear when your staff out when they will be talking about whether they are wetting their clothes and all that uh, husband or wife might come together again and they will luck to type their sexual problem but they again want to be in privacy and sure, sure, sure we don't have to talk might be your friend comes she says hello how are you and she leaks so that is what is happening to these women they are unspoken problems and we have our speaker humira noreen and my co-moderator professor alia bashir to moderate so to you professor alia bashir now to take up this case Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Maninder, and all my dear colleagues. That it's really Can you speak a to... little louder? It is no. honored to be the part of this telecom yes. no. uh, meeting. Uh, so my our first case with the uh, Dr. Humaira is that a 48 year of age old lady menopause for the last two years presented in the hospital with the complaints of hot flushes, vaginal itching, burning micturition, and painful sexual intercourse. Uh, the so first question from Dr. Humaira is, what is this sin syndrome called? And uh, uh, so can you answer uh, Dr. Humaira for that? And then uh, yeah. why the name was changed from atrophic vaginitis to the uh, gender urinary symptom of uh, menopause? And uh, when the name was changed? So I think uh, we can ask single question and then can have an answer from uh, Dr. Humera or you want me to read the all questions? So the, on the basis of the history, uh, the most probably diagnosis is the genitourinary syndrome of the menopause. And this is a new term. And previously it is known as the vulvovaginal atrophy or the atrophic vaginitis uh, or the urogenital atrophy. Your second question, why this term has been changed? Because this term has various limitations. Because of vulvovaginal atrophy, it describes the appearance of the genital tissue, but not the associated symptoms, number one. Number two, it does not include the urinary tract changes which are related to the estrogen deficiency. And third one, the term atrophy has a negative impact on the females. So now uh, vulvovaginal atrophy is considered as a part of VSF. It's a new term and which is introduced in 2014 by the consensus of uh, by the consensus of women of the sexual health in North American and menopause society. Uh, and it is called as the genitourinary syndrome of the menopause. It is a more inclusive and an accurate term. Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes. the American prevalence is quite high. The prevalence is quite high. And, uh, and yes, uh, the GSM-like symptoms, they are also prevalent in the premenopausal women in 15% of the patient, but it is highly prevalent in postmenopausal women, that is 50 to 70%. And it is more interesting that uh, the uh, severity of the symptoms, they increase as the time passes from the menopause. It means that 65% of the patient, they presented with the symptoms after one year of the menopause, but the incidence increases to 84% after six years of the menopause. So it has a great impact on the quality of the life and the sexual health because it is it, it deteriorative if it is left untreated. It also has an adverse effect on the sexual intimacy of the patient as well as the patient's confidence. So before we go into detail, what happens after the menopause? This is a picture that shows the anatomical changes in the vagina. On the right side, you can see that there is a loss of the vaginal fornix. There is a thinning of the vaginal wall. There is a loss of the regal folds. There is a decrease in the vaginal length. There is atrophy of the labia minora and majora, and there is a shortening of the uh, enteritis. So uh, in this slide, you can see the comparison of the pathophysiological changes between the premenopausal vaginal lining and the postmenopausal vaginal lining. On the left side, you can see that the 
premenopausal vaginal lining, it is a quite thick and the moist because there is a more estrogen and the estrogen is responsible for the production of the glycogen. And glycogen is further uh, hydrolyzed into the glucose. And the microbes, the predominant microbes are the lactobacilli. The glucose is taken up by the lactobacilli and it's converted into the acetic acid and lactic acid. So the pH is decreases, that is the acidic pH, that is 3.5 to 4.5. And it acts as a protective mechanism and uh, there is a decreased risk of the bacterial vaginosis and sexually transmitted diseases. On the right side, you can see the menopausal lining. This is the thin and the dry. And as there is a less estrogen, so there is a less glycogen and less conversion into the glucose. As a microbes is also changed in the postmenopausal vagina and there is the less lactobacillus. So the less production of the lactic acid and acetic acid, the pH is increased to more than 5. And there's an increased risk of the bacterial vaginosis, sexually transmitted infections, and especially the UTIs. This is another very important slide which shows the uh, different layers of the vaginal epithelium. That is the uh, that is the superficial cells, intermediate cells, parabasal cells, and the basal layer. And uh, on the left side, you can see, on the left side, you can see the pre-menopausal women, there is a thick glycogen-rich superficial cell layer. While on the right side, you can see that when there is loss of the estrogen, so there is a loss of glycogen-rich superficial layer with a subsequent increase in the intermediate and parabasal layer. You can see here that the parabasal layer has been increased as compared to the menopausal status. So for the better understanding of the pathophysiology and to uh, understand why the urinary as well as the external genitalia both are involved in this, in this syndrome, let's revise the female embryological development and the physiological mechanism. If you can recall and that the genetic sex is determined at the time of fertilization when there is a primitive gonade in the presence of XX chromosome. So there is, uh, there is development of the ovary and there are the two pairs of the genital duct. One is the mesonephric and the wolfian duct. Another is the paramesonephric or the mullerian duct. The mesonephric duct regresses in the presence of ovary while the paramesonephric duct or mullerian duct, they develop further. Next slide. So in this slide, you can see the Mullerian ducts, which are uh, uh, which are represented here with the dark maroon color. The two Mullerian ducts they join together in the center, in the center, and they form the utero vaginal canal. The lower end or the caudal tip of Mullerian tubercle it causes the induction of the vaginal plate. We can you can see in the yellow color, and and the lower down is the urogenital sinus. So you can see on the right side that the Mullerian duct. When they fuse together, they form the oviduct, they form the uterus, cervix, and the upper four fifths of the vagina. While the lower one fifth of the vagina is formed by the sinovaginal uh, plate. In this uh, diagram, you can see that the that the Mullerian uh, ducts and the sinovaginal bulb and the urogenital sinus they form uh, the vestibule, they form the urethra, trigone of the bladder, and the lower concept of the vaginal gland. That's why there is a common embryonic origin of these two systems. So, when there is a common embryonic origin of the genital and the lower urinary tract, it means that they share the common estrogen receptor function. And the urogenital tissue receptors, they are dependent on the endogenous estrogen level. So, when they're in the menopause, when there is decrease in the estrogen level or the hypoestrogenism. So it resulted in both the vulvovagina and urological symptoms. If it comes to the etiology, estrogen is the, is the main culprit, the lack of the estrogen. Estrogen is a very important hormone, it's the dominant regulator and it is a vasoactive hormone that increases the blood flow and help in the lubrication of the vagina and encourage the epithelial proliferation and formation of the nugal fold and innate defenses of the urinary tract. The endogenous estrogen is present in the body in the three forms. The estradiol, the most potent, is present in the premenopausal, estrone in the postmenopausal woman and estriol is present in the pregnant female. 
And there are three different types of the receptor. The first one is the estrogen receptor, which is highest in the vagina. Other one is the androgen receptor, which is highest in the external genitalia. And third one is the progesterone, which is present in the vagina and the transitional epithelium. And this slide shows that the estrogen receptors, they are divided into alpha uh, receptors and beta receptors. The alpha receptors, they are present in the premenopausal. Beta receptors are present in the postmenopausal, but they have a decrease, uh, 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 they have less evident in the postmenopausal female and do not respond to the endogenous estrogen. In this picture, you can see that this highlighted area shows that the high estrogen alpha and beta receptor, they are present in the vestibule, in the vagina, in the urethra, in the trigone of the urinary bladder. That's why both the, both the systems are involved because of the symptom. So when there is a loss of estrogen, there is diminished collagen and elastin and hyaluronic acid. So there is the vaginal epithelium, it becomes thin, paled and less irrigated. There is impaired smooth muscle proliferation and there is the loss of vascularity. All these, they, uh, they resulted in a decreased lubricative and elastic function of the vagina. So there is irritation as well as sexual trauma during this syndrome. This is my last slide, and this shows that all the pathophysiological changes we have discussed up till now, how they resulted in the signs and symptoms of the uh, genitourinary syndrome. These signs and symptoms, they will be discussed later with, with, uh, by one of the worthy speaker. These are the references, few of the references, latest references. Thank you, Dr. Alia. Thank you. Take over. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mera. Very well described the uh, prevalence and the uh, pathophysiology in detail, and uh, it just gives us the insight regarding how and why the role, what is the role of estrogen in pro uh, producing this uh, genitourinary symptom uh, uh, syndrome of the menopause. So our next, uh, I think, uh, will be uh, Dr. So now, uh, Dr. Humra has very nicely. She has elaborated. I think wonderful. That was, I was very happy because it was not only the talk, uh, content, either the photographs and the diagrams have been very good, excellent, especially the um, fetal origin, which is the, um, um, of them, because they having the same receptors in the urethra, in the bladder, trigon of the bladder, vagina. So they are the ones which are causing these symptoms. So three organs, vagina, urethra, and bladder, trigon, tissues, epithelium, collagen, vascular, and muscles you have highlighted. And there is effect on pH and physical appearance and functional effects. So that is the basis from where we move on further now. So that is the, so the patients, do they come with the play card? No. They don't come with the play card. Doctor, I have GSM. So we have to find out their symptoms. What are their symptoms? What are their presentations of the genitourinary <coughs> syndrome of menopause? And for that, we have none other than Dr. Chanil uh, Akanaike. I hope I'm pronouncing his no name correct. He's from the um, 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 General Sir John Kotila Wala Defense University and consultant obstetrician and gynecologist. To you, Dr. Chanil Akanaike from Sri Lanka. Hello. Well, not really. They are uh, the uh, they are not the slides, but uh, it doesn't matter. I can continue. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we can. Right. Yeah. So, uh, uh, just to recap, uh, now GSM uh, menopausal women will have many uh, problems, and these are just some of them. So. Uh, Neurological effects, uh, uh, skin uh, problems, uh, musculoskeletal problems, and then of course uh, the uh, sexual and urinary uh, problems, which we commonly call as uh, genitourinary syndrome. So uh, the importance uh, is that roughly 50% of women will have uh, GSM symptoms. So that is the significance. So one in two women will have uh, uh, genitourinary problems. And uh, the, uh, the problem with this is that the prevalence will increase with age. So the longer the menopause is, the symptoms are going to be severe. But once you take uh, 
Now, the other thing is that when you talk about uh, uh, genitourinary problems, it's a taboo area. Most women don't come out with the details and that is more so in Asiatic culture. And especially in uh, our region, the patients are, uh, unless you really probe, uh, they are not really going to sometimes come out with the details. And there might be uh, uh, variation in the symptoms and signs that she has depending on the geographic location, right? So now uh, the, uh, the dyspareunia and all might, for, for that to happen, for the superficial dyspareunia and all, she needs to be sexually active, right? So that you are more likely to see in a Western culture as opposed to a Asiatic culture. So they are, they are because of that, the symptoms what each uh, clinician will encounter in different locations will be different depending on the geographical location. So, but this is just the, uh, the entire uh, lot of symptoms that the whole uh, list of symptoms that can happen, but there may be prominence in certain factors uh, in uh, uh, certain areas. Now, for example, in uh, our country, uh, they, are, they, 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 they usually complain of uh, this uh, burning uh, vaginal soreness and uh, suprapubic pain and all. Unless you probe for vaginal dryness, they are not going to come out with that in Sri Lanka. And uh, then, of course, prolapse, we find uterine prolapse with, and also um, uh, cystocele and uh, even rectocele, they are commoner. Uh, and especially once you examine, you will find the details. A patient will not present if it's milder degree. And uh, the for this sexual uh, problems for example the, uh, the desire and uh, orgasm arousal and all those things the patient uh, needs to be sexually active and uh, they are not really they may not come out with the details unless you ask and that too might be less and our experience is that these are quite uh, low in our these type of symptoms are quite low in our setting. Of course, in an urban uh, background, it will be much more than in a rural background. Uh, the urinary ones are quite common in Sri Lanka. They usually complain about uh, urgency and urge incontinence and with some degree of stress incontinence. So, uh, so you have uh, basically what I want to say is that there, are, there is a variation in symptoms reported depending on the location. So your own uh, locality, you, you should be able to uh, tailor make your uh, inquiry uh, into the symptoms. If you can go to the next slide, please. By and large, a GSM is a clinical diagnosis. So it's history and examination that is the gold standard. And all these other tests and all have been done in relation uh, to the clinical diagnosis, taking the clinical diagnosis as the gold standard, right? Now, uh, so laboratory testing is not usually required, but if you are not sure of the appearance of the vagina, if there are uh, like lichen sclerosis or lichen planus, or there's a lesion like a growth, like a vulvar CA or even eczema, then you might consider uh, 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 maybe getting a biopsy. But other than that, uh, it's basically a clinical diagnosis. And uh, the other thing is, if you think this is GSM and you start treating and there's a poor response to it, then you can uh, think of laboratory testing, additional testing. And now, uh, currently, there are uh, there is a talk about uh, vaginal pH and vaginal maturation index. Now, vaginal pH is usually in a reproductive age woman acidic around 4.5. But in menopause, it goes up to uh, uh, 6 to 7.5, right? So the acidity, uh, the pH will go up. Uh, but the problem in using the pH is that uh, the sensitivity uh, of the test is uh, uh, around 85% if you take the pH more than 4.5. Right, but in menopause the pH will go up to around six to seven point five. So when you raise the pH much higher, 
the sensitivity is bound to come down. So it's not a reliable test, although uh, there are a few articles to say that it has been done at research level. It's not uh, going to uh, make the cut, if I were to be brief. Then about the vag vaginal maturation index, I think the previous speaker alluded to the fact how the uh, epithelial cells, uh, uh, the, the layers, the basal, parabasal, uh, intermediate, and the superficial layers, how the thickness changes. I think if you could have gone to my pre, uh, new slides, you could have seen it, but it uh, doesn't matter. I can continue on this. So uh, uh, in the reproductive age, there is a the intermediate cells. No, we are still in the previous slide. Okay. Yes, this one, no? Nah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. the intermediate, in the reproductive now. age, In the reproductive age, the intermediate cells are much more. But in uh, menopause, the parabasal cell layer thickness is going to go up, right? Uh, but this uh, is also done only at research level. There's not much of data. Uh, and there was actually an interesting article published at uh, in uh, Journal of uh, uh, South Asian uh, Federation of Gynecology, uh, Suffolk Journal, considering vaginal pH and VMI both as a diagnosis for GSM. But the problem with that is, uh, it is uh, the sample size is about 150. Uh, and uh, the uh, that is, uh, of course, not very adequate. And also, uh, the uh, the uh, the, the problem is that 70% of uh, the women in that uh, sample were asymptomatic, right? And even the pH and the VMI was compared taking the clinical diagnosis as the gold standard, right? So you're not going to find the pH and the VMI being superior to the clinical diagnosis if you use the clinical diagnosis as the gold standard, right? So if you want to prove, go beyond uh, the clinical diagnosis, you'll have to use the estrogen level or the FSH level uh, uh, to uh, as a gold standard, right? So it doesn't uh, really uh, add a lot to the uh, uh, clinical diagnosis. So basically, summary. It's mute yourself. <clears throat> yes, Sarah. Yeah. You please continue. Yeah. No, because now, yeah. So uh, basically, what I want to say is that uh, the clinical diagnosis is the is still uh, the mainstay of your uh, diagnosis. So we can go to the next slide, please. Now there is a uh, no uh, because genitourinary problems are quite uh, of an intimate nature patients usually don't come out with that. And because of that, there are various questionnaires that have come up and we are all very familiar about the MRS scale. And if you take eight, nine, and 10, that deals with uh, uh, the uh, GSM symptoms. There are some animations which I, these are not there in the slide, I think. So anyway, um, now, if you take the MRS scale and put it to our uh, population of women, now we did a study, uh, of course, it's still unpublished. Around 400 women in Sri Lanka, the problem was that 80% of the women uh, were symptomatic, which is understandable. So 80% of the women were symptomatic when you take the MRS, but out of the 80%, 80% were asymptomatic for uh, the uh, uh, GSM symptoms, right? Yeah, so this is what I want. So 80% so were symptomatic, but out of the 80% uh, of the symptomatic people, a majority did not have GSM symptoms when you take the MRS scale. So something for us to think about in Sri Lanka. So if you can go to the next slide. 
So because these symptoms are mainly related to the urinary uh, tract and also the um, uh, vagina, there is a possibility of using these ICIQ floods questionnaire, right? So which deals with urgency, urge incontinence, basically lower urine tract symptoms uh, uh, and incontinence. And you can combine that with, uh, I mean, uh, UTI, you will have to take dysuria as a uh, suggestive feature. And you, you uh, no, 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 previous, still, still I'm in the previous slide. So there is another question. I think it's not coming here in the animation. So vaginal symptoms. So the vaginal symptoms also can be identified using uh, the ICIQ, uh, International Consultation on Incontinence Questionnaire. So that's very good for identifying uh, prolapse uh, and uh, uh, vaginal symptoms. So uh, these symptoms, I mean, we have tested in Sri Lanka, it actually works. So if you combine the two, you can get make some headway. Uh, but uh, the problem is that uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the vaginal symptoms will de deal with uh, only the fact that the sex life is affected and the actual issues may not be highlighted. So that's only the, that's the only drawback if you use these two questionnaires. So if you can go to the next one. Yeah, so this is what I meant. So this should come in the previous one. So this is also quite a detailed uh, questionnaire. Yeah, I separated them into two slides. Yeah. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. Yeah. Because they were coming very small. You could not read them. So I right, have right, made right. them two slides. Yes, you can right, do fine, it. Fine, Should fine, I go back you. now or this is okay? No, no, that's fine. You can go forward. Yeah. 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 So I can go forward now? Yes, yes. So these are the vaginal symptoms which have to be used along with that questionnaire. Right, so then uh, there is a questionnaire specifically uh, detailed for uh, genitourinary syndromes of menopause. For GSM, uh, there's a questionnaire, vulvovaginal symptoms questionnaire, VSQ, right? So that uh, was published in uh, Menopause uh, Journal in 2013, right? So the problem is that there are 21 questions for GSM. Right, so that's a little too much in uh, our setting, and the problem is that prolapse is not considered, and prolapse is quite a common uh, problem. Uh, I don't know about other countries, but especially in Sri Lanka, it's quite a common problem, and a lot of the menopausal women have that to some degree of prolapse. So uh, that is the drawback in this questionnaire for GSM. So. Uh, the next slide, please, if you don't mind. Yeah, so then there is another one, uh, DIVA. So all the DIVAs, day-to-day uh, -day impact of vaginal aging. So uh, so that is to assess the impact of vaginal symptoms in postmenopausal women. Again, another 21 questions. And this is uh, mainly to deal with how they perceive uh, the symptoms and not actual symptoms. So that's one of the major drawbacks. So, uh, so the questionnaires are good because they highlight some uh, way to overcome the, uh, the taboo area or the intimate problems that the women come with, but it still does not uh, but it still cannot replace uh, your clinical judgment that is still considered the gold standard. So if you want to, now we are talking about, so basically uh, the diagnosis. So the diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis and all of these women will, will come with various symptoms. So this is just a short summary to classify uh, the, the patients so that you don't miss. So most, so, you need to exclude a urine tract infec uh, infection. Uh, if there is incontinence, that needs to be in investigated separately and treated at a higher level than GSM because G GSM symptoms are mild to moderate, right? So if they come with uh, incontinence, uh, you need to investigate whether there is uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, bladder overactivity or uh, 
platonic uh, uh, weakness. And of course, prolapse will need to be separately tracked. So if there are systemic symptoms, you can go with systemic HRT, which will answer for uh, local uh, uh, GSM symptoms. If it is not responding, you can add uh, supplement with uh, 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 local treatment uh, on top of uh, systemic HRT. But if there's only mild to moderate symptoms, uh, you can go with uh, local treatment for uh, GSM. So that is a go with uh, moisturizers and lubricants and then go for uh, uh, estrogen ointments. Um, yeah. Is this the last so, one? Uh, maybe you can, ah, uh, yes, yes. So you can, uh, if you are interested, you can download two apps uh, in different languages. Yes, 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 you can download it, yeah. Man, baby, and uh, this is Amma and baby. Okay, that's yes, what yes. I showed, yeah. Install yeah. these things, yeah. I yeah. could not understand what these were. But now yeah, I'm so they are not they are not related to your GSM. So, uh, as you said, Dr. Chanil, thank you very much. It was a wonderful, wonderful presentation, though we could not switch it over to the next one because what I could see on the WhatsApp was the same message, same heading were there. So I didn't know that this has been changed to the other one because they were coming on top of each other. So that's why the mistake. But anyway, I'll just look into and there are some extra slides we can discuss later on also. And uh, the thing is which you have said, ki basically it should be the clinical diagnosis. So the patients cannot look into the vagina. So all the patients with any vulvo vaginal symptom should be examined on an examination table with good light and speculum. Can you highlight anything about the vagina? Because you said these questionnaires, they are not covering the prolapse at all. So that means clinical examination is the first one. You said the pH is not that important because pH and uh, VMI index, uh, the maturation index, they are not exactly given the specificity. Sensitivity might be there, but specificity is not there in the diagnosis. So questionnaires also are covering a lot of questions are there, but they are not that specific to the... So that is the carry home message from you, channel. Uh, anything else you want to cover? This is the what I think uh, you have made uh, the very easy for us to understand that it's better to go by the symptoms. And locally, what we, you would like to see in the vagina, which we should be seeing, like what uh, for a general practitioner, what you are going to, what should they should be looking into vagina, should look like what? Pale, without rugosities. So that is stretchable, won't be, might be too stretchable or might be narrowed also. Have you ever seen the adhesions there? Local adhesions? Yes, yes. Now, the one, another thing I want to, uh, I think we, we need to stress is that now sometimes you might see atrophic vaginitis changes and uh, the uh, the typical changes of the rugosity being lost and the vagina being flushed and all. But keep in mind that the absence of symptom, absence of signs does not exclude GSM. That is, I think, a very important thing. So the examination may be normal, but still she might be having symptoms. That's a very and important that is, point. That is, and more so when they are close upon menopause. Uh, so that's a very subtle thing that you need to pick up, if they're, especially if they're sexually active and all. Uh, and uh, so around menopause, the absence of... Uh, Science does not exclude uh, GSM. Yes, sir. But does in these cases pH examination is going to help help us? Uh, no, I don't think so. Because now uh, pH examination to diagnose menopause or for GSM? For GSM. Uh, no, because uh, uh, one is it's invasive. And you're going for pH detection, uh, the sensitivity is about 85% if it is over 4.5. But the pH in a uh, menopausal woman, even in the absence of symptoms, is going to be around 6 to 7.5. So it's not really a useful, uh, I mean, at a research level, you can talk about it, but it's not, uh, you might, you're going to miss a fair amount of patients. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Chenil. That was a wonderful presentation. And now we go to Dr. Tarun Pradhan.
who is Professor Virat Medical College Teaching Hospital, Kathmandu University, Nepal. And I tell you, I really feel very encouraged when the Nepal people, they come and uh, join us because they have been silent for a few years and we want them to be very, very active now in the South Asian Federation Aminopath Societies. So genital urinary syndrome of menopause, non-hormonal management, something. Because it's not always that we'll be seeing the um, uh, vaginal irritation because of the GSM or those symptoms because of the GSM. There might be some contributory other factors also. And it's not always because it's because of the uh, hypoestrogenic state. So first line of treatment is not always the hormones only locally. First line of treatment can be any other things, non-hormonal treatment also. So Dr. Tarun Pradhan, uh, to you. These are good your evening. Points, huh? yeah, good evening. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma good evening, everyone. Namaskar. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you very much, ma'am, for the this educational platform. So to start with, I I am I'll be focusing more on non-hormonal aspect of management only. So as we have already known that GSM includes genital urinary symptoms as well as sexual symptoms. Next slide. So apart from that, it can also be the symptoms can also be because of some other non-hormonal genital urinary. Uh, causes so that should be ruled out before we proceed to any management so it can be because of any uh, perfumes powders or deodorants spermicides lubricants causing contact dermatitis or before you we go on treatment for our urinary symptoms we have to rule out infections excessive if the if the lady is indulged in excessive water intake or if she is having more of blood irritants or is she in any drugs that is causing some abnormality in urinary uh, symptoms? So these are uh, the things that should be looked upon. So what options do we have then? So, uh, so these are the options. So among these, I'll be focusing only on non-hormonal aspect of the management. Next. Next. So, so my part in this uh, webinar is to eliminate vaginal dryness and urinary symptoms without use of hormones. Next. So to start with, so the management is a preliminary management for any GSM. So it is a lifestyle change and physical therapy is number one, because we have to rule out before proceeding to the management. We have to see if she is smoker, then we have to counsel her to stop smoking because smoke has been uh, seen to increase estrogen metabolism, causing hypostrogenic condition in genital urinary epithelium. And also you have to properly examine pelvis, pelvic musculature, if there is difficulty in relaxation or increased tone of levator muscle. So that is the thing that you should uh, rule out uh, during the process of management. And there are options like lubricants. So lubricants can be water-based, gel-based, or silicone-based. So the, the best part of the lubricant is it is not absorbed uh, in the skin. So it, it is uh, fast acting, but you need to use it whenever it is required. And the water-based is more because it, is, it will cause less staining. So gel, can cause some degradation of uh, latex. Uh, so while, while using, uh, while cohabiting with, so it can cause problem in the uh, barrier contraception, causing, um, leading more towards sexually tra transmitted infections. Next. Next slide. Then, then there is a moisturizer. So in most moisturizer, uh, it has more of a long uh, uh, lasting, action because moisturizing agent will um, uh, remain in a superficial, superficial epithelial surface and it has a property to retain uh, the water and uh, and give uh, uh, the environment as a, a, a lubricating environment in the genital um, uh, epithelium so it, that will relieve dyspareunia or vaginal irritations or dryness then there is a hyaluronic acids that is there. So it is basically a polysaccharide containing uh, chemical agent. 
And um, so these polysaccharide containing uh, agent will attract water in extracellular uh, tissue. So that will also help uh, in retaining water and causing more of uh, uh, lubrications in the genital tract. So then, now the, then comes um, uh, uh, pharmacological uh, options like uh, selective estrogen receptor modulator. As we all uh, all are quite first with different SCRMs because SCRM are non-steroidal uh, synthetic drugs that has some agonist antagonistic actions in the, in the estrogen receptor. So, but uh, the, in GSM. The thing is that the action should uh, should not be on the uterine uh, or endometrium and the breast. So, so ospimifen is the drug that is uh, is more accepted by FDA for uh, the use for GSM. And uh, uh, as as in a publication, so it has uh, the sixty milligram daily has shown to have significant improvement in patient discomfort and objective quality of life assessment in vaginal pH as well as vaginal maturation index. But in contradiction to that, there are some, uh, some uh, publications suggesting that it has more propensity to increase the risk for visometer symptom and penis thromboembolism, but it is still under scrutiny. Next. The latest SCRM is bazidoxifen. Um, the, the study shows that the, the single use of bazidoxifen uh, for increasing superficial cells in the epithelium uh, and subjective symptom relief is improved more if it is used with conjugated estrogen than, than it, it is used alone. So it is best if it's used with the estrogen. Then comes, there are certain bioidentical hormones, like few FDA approved hormones are like synthetic estrogens or progesterones, but uh, the, the nature, natural, uh, natural cyticals uh, chemical agents, uh, so the, the, the bioidentical hormones that is more popular in, uh, that is frequently used in clinical practice, they are usually not approved by SUZ or FDA. So patients should be informed that bioidentical hormones have the same risk as any similar hormone preparation among with additional risk related to potential lack of purity and potency. So it should be used with caution. Next. There comes then the isoflavones that we all know it is from soy. So it uh, so the study have shown that the two double blinded placebo control trial in Vazina using 4% soy uh, isoflavin gel has shown to improve vaginal atrophy symptom or maturation values and vaginal pH in 60 menopausal women, but uh, the data is quite insufficient, but it has shown some positive and encouraging result. Next. So apart from genital symptoms, then uh, we also have a urinary symptoms to look for in GSM. So when uh, a lady comes with uh, GSM with predominant urinary symptoms, then, then the management uh, in a non-hormonal aspect of management, we again have to see if there are some modifiable risk factors that can be dealt with before proceeding for hormonal management. So you have to see if she's smoker again, if she's taking, how is the fluid management she's taking? Like she's, if, if she's um, uh, drinking heavily during, uh, before sleep or during daytime, if she's obese or if she is smoker, if she's uh, taking uh, more of a bladder irritants like caffeine or COA products or, and uh, then we have to look, uh, we have to see that it can be dealt with some bladder training uh, physical therapies or bladder training counseling, then we can also try with pelvic floor muscle exercises. Next. And though the hormone will be dealt with uh, the other speaker, but still in urinary symptom, focusing only in urinary symptom, 
it is shown that the local hormonal application for urinary symptom is more effective than the systemic hormone, according to the publications. Next. Then again comes the role of uh, SCRM in uh, urinary aspect of GSM as well, but uh, the, the effectiveness of SCRM is more for a genital symptom than the urinary system uh, symptom with overactive bladder symptom. But, but if we have to use, then osmimifen is the chosen uh, drug. And for uh, if there are predominant urinary symptoms with overactive bladder or urge urinary incontinences, then there are some drugs that are either it can be anticholinergic drugs or beta-3 agonist, uh, mirabegron. So there are different uh, anticholinic drugs with um, latest being a solifenacin and um, then tolteradine and with variable degree of uh, adverse uh, drug effects like dry mouth. And so uh, it can be used uh, with uh, proper history and, con uh, and confirming the urinary diagnosis by various means like history, examination, urophlometry, or urodynamic studies. Next. Or we can combine uh, these pharmacological therapies. So you, we, you know, usually in, in our practice, we have a tendency to combine it with uh, a local estrogen therapy, and then you give a anticholinergic drug. But studies, uh, the result is quite contradictory. It has, it is, um, but it is more positive if uh, the anticholinergic drug is combined with mirabegron it has shown more positive results than if we combine it with uh, local estrogens. Next. So if it is refractory to any drugs, then there are certain other uh, urine, uh, other mode of management for urinary symptoms, like we can give a botulinum toxin by cystoscopy, or we can do a, uh, uh, do a sacral neuromodulations by a biofeedback therapy. We can also use acupuncture needle uh, and joining it with some electronic device by through posterior tibial nerve stimulation, which is which has a more positive uh, result. So I think this is it for me. That was, yeah, that was your last slide. Yeah, this is it for me for uh, for a non-hormonal management. So thank you once again, ma'am, for and the opportunity. Arun, that was a wonderful, I think, coverage. Because uh, being the non-hormonal, because uh, genitourinary syndrome of menopause is always associated with estrogen therapy, estrogen therapy, and estrogen therapy. That's what we are discussing. So that's why I wanted uh, uh, non-hormonal or non-estrogenic therapies also to be uh, discussed. And of course, the uh, bladder problems we'll be taking in next uh, webinar in details because there are other urinary problems in the menopause besides hypoestrogenic state also, so that we'll cover in, uh, uh, later on. Any questions? Uh, anybody wants to comment, uh, Dr. Yeah, Manitar, I want to say something. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, I want to say something. Ah, Pushpa, yes, please. So, uh, uh, non-hormonal management, uh, number one, congratulations. Your presentation was very good, uh, doctor. Uh, the non-hormonal management does have a very important role in uh, GSM. Uh, especially in milder cases uh, of the uh, problems and plus in breast cancer patients. You know, when the breast cancer patients are on tamoxifen and uh, aromatase inhibitors, it leads to suppression of estrogens, even if it's a perimenopausal lady. And if she is sexually active, uh, she because of the suppression, she faces the same problem of GSM as does a postmenopausal woman. So there, uh, bec uh, bec uh, you cannot use, it is not advisable to use uh, hormones the non-hormonal options have great importance and they are the first line of treatment in any breast cancer patient who is on tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors. Thank you very much, ma'am. Yeah, so that's a good point, especially and one point which I want to talk about DHEA is the intracellular uh, intracrinology that is coming about with DHEA where it is a locally acting drug. 
it will be converted in the vaginal cells only into estrogens and uh, androgens, testosterone, and then they will be metabolized in the cell itself. So that is what is now coming up the uh, intracrinology of these products. So that is, I think we will be taking in details because that could have taken a lots of discussion. That's why I did not cover in this thing. The only thing is this diagram shows the how DHEA enters into the cells, changes into testosterone, estradiol, and it has local effects. That's why it doesn't go into the circulation and no levels of estradiol and testosterone are raised and their pro products are also metabolized in the cells itself. So that's all I wanted to cover now. Side effects of osfamifin, he has covered nicely. So thank you. Thank you. This. Uh, Tarun from my side for uh, avoiding the painful intercourse by using the first line therapy as the moisturizer and the lubricants. So lubricants be used for entry purposes. Moisturizer if used late, uh, daily uh, or regularly can increase the vaginal thickness. So that is the advantage of them. And later on we'll be having other energy based devices which Rimi Singla will be talking after the estrogen therapy we had talked. So now we welcome uh, Dr. Sohili Nargis for her talk on genitourine syndrome, menopause, her unspoken problem, hormone treatment. Thank you very much, ma'am, for a uh, kind introduction. Distinguished chief guest, guest of honors, panel moderator, co-moderator, speakers, learned C listeners, assalamu alaikum. I, Dr. Sohili Nargis, as a professor at Kumudini Women's Medical College from Bangladesh, am honored and privileged to have the opportunity to present the paper on hormonal treatment of genital urinary syndrome of menopause in SAFOM webinar. Though non-hormonal treatment modality is the first line of treatment, hormonal treatment, especially local vaginal estrogen, has been the treatment of choice for decades. It is the gold standard. Let us see what are the advantages. Vaginal estrogen is effective at a lower dose. It reaches less amount to the bloodstream, thus limits overall estrogenic exposure. It provides better direct relief of symptom than the oral estrogen preparation. We have different estrogen preparation um, at different doses and route of administration and choice depends on the patient's preference and severity of the same symptoms. So we can see here that is topical vaginal estrogens are in the form of the cream, pessary, ring, vaginal tablet, and there is also topical androgen, topic local is testosterone. And um, how they act, that's mechanism of action of all the vaginal estrogens except the ring, is about that this loading dose followed by the maintenance dose. So uh, after giving the loading dose, what happens? That is absorption of the estrogen is highest during the first few days of treatment. Then when the vaginal epithelium is more atrophic, it causes decreased vaginal pH, increased vascularity, increased number of lactobacilli, and causing favorable shift in the vaginal and or urethral cytology. As a result, uh, more superficial cell and less parabasal cells, followed by the maintenance dose. Once the once the uh, endo epi, uh, endo uh, endo metrium, uh, becomes thickened, that is maturity achieved, then less estrogen is needed to prevent the further recurrence. So we can see here the pre different preparations that is estrogen cream. That is uh, it contains uh, about. Um, 14 gram and one, uh, one milligram in one gram. And uh, this is the pessary, vaginal estrogen pessary. Um, each pessary contains estrogen 0.5 milligram. And this is the estradiol tablet. Uh, each tablet contains 10 microgram. But cream is more uh, messy and cumbersome and uh, more discharge occurs with the cream, but uh, then the tablet, vaginal ring or um, pessaries. So this is the uh, ring, just only ring. Uh, it should be um, give, um, taken by the patient herself. And after uh, introduction, it is kept for the 90 days. So um, it uh, contains two milligram of uh, estradiol and each day 7.5 microgram 
is released. So now the conjugate equine estrogen, this primary is very common drug, but it has some uh, systematic absorption uh, occurs, which causes in estrogenic side effect. So uh, UK has uh, already withdrawn this uh, drug, but in many countries, uh, it is using and Bangladesh is also available. Uh, so what about the estrol or estradiol? Which one is the safer? We all know that estrol is the uh, uh, hormone of the pregnancy and estradiol is the hormone of the reproductive age. It is said that estrol is associated with the greater systemic absorption, but due to weak estrogen, it is not converted to the estradiol. As a result, less systemic estrogenic side effect. And another thing is local concentration is more with the estriol, so more advantageous for the woman with the GSM. So what about the efficacy? The latest Cochrane review showed a study among 6,235 postmenopausal women with local use of estrogen for the GSM. Author concluded that, that there were no significant different in the efficacy among different estrogen preparation. So um, there, if a patient cannot use estrogen preparation, for them, uh, total uh, topical androgen is important. And this is the vaginal DHEA, that is presterone. And the, it is a steroid hormone. It is an intermediate biosynthesis of the androgen and estrogen. Previously, it was uh, already told that is uh, at menopause, DHEA uh, is the exclusive precursor for all the steroid hormones and androgen, androgen receptors are elsewhere in the genital urinary uh, tract. When the synthetic DHA is given, it exerts trophic effect on various genital urinary tissue by transforming by, by the DHA into estrogen and androgen, and both of them causing um, decrease the symptom and increase the libido. So, uh, there, there is another thing that is topical testosterone cream. It is very limited data for supporting this cream for the treatment. And one uh, study showed that it causes improvement of the sexual satisfaction and vaginal symptoms associated with aromatase inhibitor that is used in the breast cancer. So these are the local hormone with the doses. Uh, so already it was uh, cleared and all the all the um, creams and tablets are usual dose followed by the maintenance dose and ring is for the 90 days. So what about the safety? Local estrogen causes acute rise of the plasma estradiol level with a peak at eight hours and return to the baseline at 12 hours. And this baseline level never rises again after that when the estrogen is stopped or restored. So another uh, study showed that is uh, uh, from the um, this estrogen system metrically absorbed from the vagina in a dose dependent manner and where use of low dose estro estrogen therapy remains within the postmenopausal range. That is one to 30 picogram per ml. So another shows that when low dose vaginal ring is used, uh, it ranges from the five to 10 picogram per ml. Vaginal tablet when used, it is ranged from three to 11 picogram per ml. And in case of vaginal insert, one study showed that uh, in the comparison with the placebo, uh, it is 3.6 and 4.6 and placebo 4.3 picogram per ml. So all are within the postmenopausal range. And another study showed that serum estradiol level uh, compared with the placebo, which is used for the 84 days, there was no difference of the level. And estradiol cream, in a, with the estradiol cream, there is a controversy because one study showed for three weeks use, no change in the serum estradiol. And one study showed uh, three weeks use with the 16 to 37 picogram per ml. Um, she, uh, ch change of the baseline. And conjugate, what about the conjugate estrogen uh, premarine cream? Uh, we already told that, that there is some uh, systemic absorption, but here uh, in a study, we can see that there is no change in the serum, estradiol, or estrone level. So this is a uh, chart. Um, sorry.
so here another study with uh, different preparation and different uh, with different number of pa uh, patients and with different periods. And here we, we here it is say, seen that that endometrial thickness is within less than five millimeter, and all the mean serum level is within the postmenopausal level. So what about the systemic hormonal therapy? Uh, it is the if a patient is getting systemic HRT for the vasomotor syndrome and she has associated with the GSM, the, it is uh, seen that HRT can help only 25%. And, but for only GSM, um, this is his, systemic hormonal therapy is not approved by FDA and NICE is also not recommended. So uh, local vaginal estrogen is recommended. And what about the patient with the breast cancer? Uh, more than 60% of the postmenopausal women with breast cancer suffer from the symptoms of the GSM. And it is a challenge when there is estrogen receptor positive breast cancer patient. So they, these patients, when taking tamoxifen or uh, aromatase inhibitor, inhibitor with a persistent or severe problem and not responding to the um, non-hormonal therapies, uh, then decision of the decision should be taken by, with the consultation of oncologist and they can offer low dose local vaginal estrogen. So my previous uh, uh, presenter uh, presents very um, already told that is about the SERM, so I'm skipping it. So it is all, uh, in our country, it is not used but it is currently approved in the European country, especially, and it is very important for the overactive bladder and stress incontinence. And it is contraindicated if the patient is undiagnosed or postmenopausal bleeding occur or patient having suspected estrogen dependent neoplasia. And caution should be taken if there is active or history of venous thromboembolism. So, in conclusion, what is the take home message? Education about the GSM is recommended for perimenopausal and postmenopausal women. Uh, and screening of the GSM should is, is recommended. And who are not respond to the first line treatment, uh, they should prescribe effective options are low dose vaginal estrogen therapy, vaginal DHEA, ospimifen, and uh, systemic, um, not, not the systemic. And the conclusion with the history, if patient has a history of the breast or endometrial cancer, uh, consultation with the oncologist is must. Uh, if a patient, uh, usually if patient low, with the low dose uh, estrogen therapy is unlikely to have coronary heart disease, stroke, venous thromboembolism, breast and endometrial cancer, use of progesterone is not recommended uh, um, with the low dose vaginal estrogen therapy and safety uh, if a patient is if using the estrogen for longer than uh, one year, a clinical trial data is not yet available. And routine endometrial surveillance is not recommended for asymptomatic women using low dose vaginal ET. And if there is an increased risk of the endometrial carcinoma, uh, that's then TVS or intermittent progesterone therapy may be considered. And the last is, if there is spotting or bleeding in a postmenopausal woman, requires a thorough evaluation uh, by TVS and endometrial biopsy. So, um, at last, what is the best and what is universal? It's a big question. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for patience hearing. Dr. Alia Bashir. Dr. Uh, yes. Alia Bashir, yeah, yeah, yeah. please comment and take the discussion. <laughs> Uh, it is a wonderful presentation by Sohi, and she has very nicely uh, talked about uh, non-hormonal treatment as well as the hormonal treatment. As uh, one thing I was wondering, and I wanted to ask regarding uh, the treatment, that if the patient has been given the local estrogens uh, hormones in the form of DHAE or uh, for the three weeks, and the patient symptoms uh, disappears, but if she started to have this problem again then when she can again start this and for how long the treatment can again be continued again for the three weeks or what I want to uh, ask the question from the Sohi to just to make the clear things for the audience as well uh, that after three weeks when the patient can start again the treatment and for how long she can uh, take it again if she needs to have uh, the symptoms or if she is suffering from some symptoms again. Dr. Shoili, thank you very how much. How long can we give the hormonal treatment and you have said of course the 
uh, this is not required, uh, surveillance is not required, but there may be some special cases where we need the surveillance. Where is she is not there? Where has she gone? Yes, okay. I'm, I'm here. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is uh, not specifically told in um, in anywhere, but it is an another controversy that is how long we can use for um, local estrogen or other things. But symptom uh, is uh, appearing uh, and uh, stop and appearing. So some somewhere it was written that it is uh, continue for three three months, and somewhere sometimes it is said that that it it can be given for one year. And it, it, it depends on the patients. If patient symptoms appear, then after uh, uh, excluding the risk factor, it can be started. And as long as possible, it should be given at least time. Uh, Dr. You, Zinna, your comment? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Actually, Sahili, you are okay. But in certain cases, what Dr. Maninder has said, in special cases, particularly, you know, survival of the breast cancer, we have to give a very close monitoring. Now the question, answer to the question, you have said rightly, the most of the data showed that up to one year, it is safe. And some data, last time it has been, that up to 24, of, uh, 24 months, that's been two years can be given safely. But if the patient symptoms, I mean, is good, we can stop at any time. But the question was if three weeks she used and then again she started having the problem, what you are going to do, Sahili? Yeah, we can start again, no problem, because the vagin is so thin. After two to three weeks, only the normal absorption starts, but still it is thin and dry. So you can start it again with the same dose, no problem. Thank you very much, Boninder, for the wonderful. Yeah, thank you, Zinat. As the Dr. Humera and Noreen first talked, she told this is a progressive disease. So we should always keep in mind and tell the patient it's a progressive disease. It will go on increasing because it's because of the receptors. Receptors are getting depleted. So hypoestrogenic state is going to be there. The patients are going to leave because they feel so good after two, three weeks or one month. They feel we are okay. So they will leave it. But then they will again come back with the symptom again and again. And uh, then we have to start them using. But of course, when we are giving them beyond one year, I think we should doing one TBS transvaginal sonography and see the endometrial thickness in these cases where we have to give again and again because of the symptom persistent. Or then we can come with the help of Dr. Rimi Singla perhaps where we have the other therapies available. Dr. Pushpa, would you like to comment? Yeah, actually what happens when these patients, you have two types of patients. One of them, after using two, three months, they are all right and they stop. The second type, uh, when you are you have gone down, you have tapered the dose down to maybe once a week or twice a week. They are very comfortable and they keep using it and they don't want to stop it. So you have these two types. So beyond one year, again, as everybody has said, there, are, there is no data. Uh, maybe now 24 to two, uh, months to two years, but they will, they want to keep on and on. So they have to be actually kept under surveillance. Yes. Uh, these are those patients. And so since it's a progressive thinking, if she has stopped, she'll come back to you again with the problems because, uh, you know, uh, uh, they it, it will come back again because the, uh, the hyperestrogenic state will continue. So good. That's what, in those cases, perhaps we have to do a simple surveillance of um, yeah. uh, endometrial thickness by transmitting. Yeah. I think I'll share my and we'll go to the next speaker now. Anybody wants to comment? Or at the end of the this thing, Dr. Imi Singla's talk will have again comments. Can I, I make, a comment? Uh, yes. make a comment? Yes, make a comment. Yes, Aida, please, please. Yes, uh, I have used uh, uh, local estrogens and uh, long term, once initially we give it every night for a month or two, then we make it alternate nights then we make it uh, maybe if they are maintaining well we make it once a week and gradually uh, they are very comfortable using it once a week and some do follow up and some don't so we really don't know how much benefit they have because of the follow-up issues so i think there is a role of long-term use yes so when we are using for long term we should do the follow-up also because the studies have been for one year only you people are muted, actually. Madam? Yeah. 
I am just one question. Ma'am, in Bangladesh, we are frequently using smepivin, and it is highly effective, practically. And my question to you, how long we can continue with smepivin? Osmepivin has been tried for uh, 60 milligram per day for, I think, uh, again, one year or two years only. There are no can, I add, can I add, Maninda? Yeah. Well, yes, please. Uh, yeah, osmepivin, osmepivin is a safe drug. Only that there's a child, um, uh, only side effect is there could be so apparently healthy women without having risk of stroke or thromboembolism, we can continue osmepivin. There's no hard and fast rule that you have to stop it here. But probably all the hormones say for side that we should not go beyond five years. Shahi. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, usually patients do feel better after six months use. So that's my question is how long we can continue. Thank you very much. Actually, you, you need to individualize. Okay, if a patient is happy, she doesn't need, you can stop it. Now we come to the topic, 55 years female, same. Our, she's coming with all these complaints of urine and uh, um, on examination, find a vagina with neurogastic pale, some petechi, mons pubicis, atrophy. And she has tried the hormone, she had tried the uh, moisturizers and everything, but some or the other, uh, she will use for a little while, she won't get any advantage now. She wants something else. Perhaps what are the energy devices which can help? So we'll be coming to that, our next speaker, Dr. Remy Singla. So why, uh, what are the indications in cosmetic gynecology where we can use them? When you are using them, what precautions you are going to take them? Cost effectiveness of these, uh, what is the evidence in literature? And can they be used in younger women also? These are the, some of the questions which I think Dr. Remy Singla would be uh, answering. She has been already introduced. She's from Mohali, Punjab, Director Radiance Hospital. So we won't spend any time in introducing except showing her photograph where she's being awarded by um, uh, Honorable Health Minister of Punjab, Mr. Chetan Singh, for her excellent work in IVF and laparoscopy also. So beyond in cost, beyond cosmetic gynecology, role of energy devices in genitourinary syndrome of menopause. So you over to you, Dr. Rimi Singla. Now, thank you, you ma'am. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Maninda ma'am. Uh, for giving me this opportunity and for making me a part of this beautiful webinar on Safon. Uh, like the, this topic is always a hidden topic. I think the, in our routine conferences, we are not dealing this type of topics, but definitely ma'am, your effort will give a, I mean, it will give a good look and we are touching this type of topics for our young gynecs also and for our uh, budding gynecs also. Thank you ma'am, thank you very much. Uh, in my slides, I am going to uh, take over about the energy-based devices and which devices are with me and uh, what is my experience for that, that I am going to discuss. Basically, if I will say there are a lot of energy devices in the market uh, and uh, recent technology development, it triggered and a lot of publications also, a lot of research also, but still we need a lot of data and we have to collect that data from a, as per the Indian scenario. If we are saying like post-menopausal woman, uh, uh, first slide only, please. Uh, post-menopausal women and events like childbirth and aging, they cause definitely structural and functional changes in women's genitalia that already we have discussed. The arising implications don't only cause psychological stress, but negatively affect the sexual well-being and the biological quality of their lives. In a basically function of energy-based devices to uh, categorize, I mean, we have to touch only these two topics, like sexual well-being and for their quality of life in their fun. So what is the revolutionary change? If you see like a uh, lot of uh, energy-based in devices in the market now. Dimi, can, I, can I intervene? There is some resonance in your voice. Are you using something? You can uh, come nearer to the mic, I think. No, it's coming like a distance. Okay. Try again. Yeah. Revolutionary changes. Now it is clear. My voice is clear now. My voice is breaking up like it's not that clear. 
Are you using headphones? Okay, anyway, let's go on. What about others? Everybody can hear? Chalo, let's yes, move on. Can hear. Yes, yes can let's hear. move on. Hmm. Uh, assessing the efficacy of laser and radio frequency on the vaginal wall in reversing natural aging process. And there are a lot of studies that showed a certain degree of thermal energy from all the energy devices deposited on the vaginal wall. And it's okay. Hmm. Yeah, and it stimulates the proliferation, uh, proliferation of the glycogen uh, and rich epithelium, neovascularization and collagen formation in the lamina propria. Basically, this is the only mechanism of action with all the energy-based devices, whether we are using CO2, whether we are using diode, whether we are using RF, whether we are using HIFU, and whether we are using some other. And it all in improves the natural lubrication and control of urination. And next slide, please, ma'am. Yes, sir. And this regenerative, it is an upcoming branch and upcoming procedures. These, these procedures enable women to treat the, their functionality issues and modify the physical structure of the vagina. Uh, and uh, we can discuss about the latest development in this field with regards to various kinds of procedures that are available, particularly with the use of energy base and adipose tissue derived stem cells also for fat grafting, which have Revolutionized the uh, regenerative gynecology procedures. And cosmetic gynecology, it enables the pelvic floor toning and regain the integrity of the tissue, hence giving an opportunity to women to achieve a better quality of life through their increased comfort and sexual confidence. But what are the options? These are minimal invasive procedures, PRP therapy, lipofilling, that is uh, fat transfer, lipograph, energy-based devices, Surface cooled monopolar radio frequency, cryo uh, cooled monopolar radio frequency, RBM laser, CO2 laser, HIFU, diode 1470, but now market one more diode is coming, that is 680. Next, please. Uh, if we look for the PRP, I think everyone is aware of PRP. What is the PRP and why we are using in our uh, routine uh, postmenopausal females for their uh, genital syndrome of menopause? No, ma'am, please. PRP basically that is for vaginal rejuvenation. Over the last 20 years, we are using as effective treatment for various indications like bones, for orthopedics, for soft tissue injuries, and for other uh, scars and burns. But in cosmetically, it is why it is used? Because it is enriched with several growth factors and cytokines and that is released in response to cellular damage and stimulates the process of fibroblast collagen synthesis. And second, there is no side effect with the use of PRP. Next, please. What scientific evidence is behind the PRP? If we'll see, there is now there are a lot of evidence for to support the, the use of PRPs in our cosmetic gynecology procedures, there is one study in 2017, uh, 68 women of ages in between 32 to 90 years to measure their response to PRP as a treatment of overactive bladder, stress incontinence, various degree of sexual dysfunction for their orgasm, to for their libido, for their dyspareunia, and lack of lubrication. Usually, we give two sessions of PRP uh, around uh, two. Uh, it, it depends upon individual to individual. It depends upon gynecologist to gynecologist. How many sessions we have to give? Normally, we are giving two sessions around a four weeks apart and results reveal that 94% of women, they were satisfied with their increased libido, increased orgasm and uh, uh, this dyspareunia also. This study concluded that the treatment is very effective and safe for the woman seeking changes in the vulva vagina region. And indication and mode of action of EBD, that is uh, this energy-based devices that I have already covered, it increases the proliferation of vaginal epithelium, stimulating the neopolygogenesis and increased vascular and neural regeneration, thereby moving from pure aesthetics to functional gynecology application. CO2 laser. If we'll discuss about the CO2 laser, um, in market, uh, CO2 laser like Mona Lisa and uh, one more Alma people, they came to India for uh, with the, the CO2 lasers. CO2 laser, the carbon dioxide, uh, what is the function? Like it emits light at wavelength of 10,600, which is greatly absorbed by the tissue water. And the depth of penetration is dependent upon the water content while being independent of melanin and hemoglobin. And the heat produced by this laser, it denatures the proteins and upregulates the 
PGF beta, which in turn activates the, their fibrogenic process. Basically, the basic fungi is for the neocollagenesis. And this treatment has been found to be highly efficacious in rejuvenating the vulvovaginal tissues. And there are a lot of studies that have reported significant improvement in indications. And it is one of the first study performed by Cruz et al. reported that CO2 therapy it improve a number of symptoms for GSM as compared to the group that was subjected to vaginal estrogen therapy. In this study, he enrolled around 45 postmenopausal women with the GSM. Uh, I mean, he enrolled in this study. Next, ma'am, please. Uh, this this is basically hypo that is high frequency focus ultrasound. This machine is with me. This is my personal machine. I have a lot of data for this machine. Uh, like uh, uh, in which uh, woman we are using this? This um, various factors decrease the amount of elasticity available due to the natural collagen being replaced with the fibers that don't contain the same levels of elasticity. It can affect many areas of women's life, including their intercourse and urinary incontinence. Painless vaginal rejuvenation treatment is the perfect answer to both of these frustrations and is a quick and easy procedure. This is the like uh, uh, configuration which we are using. I mean, this machine, if you look for the machine, ma'am, get back to the machine. I'll show you. No, ma'am, back. Previous one? Yeah, previous one, uh, the machine which I have shown you. That's what they will show you. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, this, this machine, this has two probes. I mean, if we look for this, this one is the, uh, just like our trans vaginal probe. I mean, this, this one is long one is vaginal probe. This is for vaginal tightening. And this one is for your skin tightening. Like for this, with this, with the help of this probe, we can do a face tightening. We can do a double chin reduction and we can do a little bit of breast lifting also. And we can do a skin tightening around the abdominal area. And this, uh, this vaginal probe, it only has a cartridge. Next slide, ma'am, please. Yeah, this cartridge. Next, uh, last one, ma'am. Yeah, these are, this is the configuration. Basically, power cartridge, it has 10,000 shots. And what is the energy type? This is basically hypo and function is face lifting, skin reju rejuvenation and vaginal rejuvenation. Next, ma'am, please. And this uh, hypo technology uh, for the treatment of GSM, for the stress incontinence, for the vaginal hyperlexy. Uh, the regeneration of genital tissue using EBD is revolutionary. And GSM is a condition with high, very high prevalence, around 75% on which the main international gynecologic associations are working, which has been recently redefined or renamed as previously called as urogenital atrophy. And this HIFU as energy equipment in order to provide an adequate control and regulate thermal action. Uh, many of them recovered orgasm and sexual satisfi uh, uh, satisfaction in, is an, another sign that many patients, they don't lose their libido, but withdraw from sex as a consequence of pain and the resulting inability to feel satisfaction. Next one. This is the mechanism of action I've covered already. Uh, this is my center study that I've done at my center. Uh, like, uh, uh, what are the inclusion and what are the exclusion criteria? Inclusion criteria is stress urinary incontinence, but of low grade. And separate episodes of urinary incontinence associated with increase of abdominal pressure, like with the help, when she's coughing, when she's having uh, uh, increased abdominal pressure, her, she's having complaint of mild urinary leakage, but uh, no cystocele. And next one. And this is the exclusion criteria. Patients suffer urogenital operations if she had underwent any operation, if she had underwent a history of cancer and she is already on radiation treatment, any history of a neuromuscular disorders, uncontrolled diabetes, pregnancy, lactation. And patients undergo conservative treatment for stress, urinary incontinence uh, from other. Uh, She's on aspirin and other drugs, active carcinoma or sepsis. Next one. If you look, I have enrolled in my study 80 in last uh, in SAR conference at Agra. I have presented this paper. Uh, this 80 patients have enrolled in my study. Next, ma'am. And uh, this is the basically uh, part uh, in which we I have given uh, HIFU plus PRP therapy also. I have enrolled 
uh, both therapies in my study and I've given a three cycles of Thaipu at around four to six weeks in term. Next map. All patients informed, like at our center, we are taking informed consent from every patient and it is completely must to take consent from every patient because we cannot give any 100% commitment to any patient. And only patients with mild to moderate incontinence, postmenopausal patients with a minimum of three years since their last menstruation, post hysterectomy, postpartum with symptoms of dry hair. Next one. Dryness, burn, uh, burning, recurrent vaginal, vaginal discharge or cystic. And in this procedure, what we are, I have done with my, in my, with my machine, I have given uh, two 350 degree rounds for perform. Uh, this probe is around 7.5 centimeter deep into the vagina. And this intravaginal rotation angle of the device uh, the angle in between that is 5 degree, which produces a total of 56 lines. All patients receive a complete vaginal treatment using a transducer with a focal depth of 3 mm. The protocol followed as described above. All the patients will undergo two cycles in 30-day interval. Before each treatment cycle, patients will be examined. Next time. And treatment I have already discussed. Next time. Results, if we'll see, confirm the assumption that its potential therapeutic effect and offer positive and valid conclusion to consider its use as necessary as the preferred therapy or complementary to laser. If we'll see the results, the change sexuality of all patients, it improves significantly. Uh, the, uh, basically, the change is related to many of the positive effects uh, in GSM due to its thermal effect. And mucosal tissue recovery and the restoration of their vaginal lubrication, elasticity, and compliance by this neophologogenesis and NGO, which are characteristics of its thermal effect added to the anatomical restoration. Next map. So, this is a discussion basically with 80 to 90 percent of individuals presenting an adequate therapeutic response after two or three sessions. Follow up controls confirming the persistence of the benefits achieved within a year. Results are promising and more, but Definitely, it uh, needed a further research. Next one. Conclusion, we understand follow-up still short, but the results obtained so far with this study and the persistent cannot be ignored. And we are adding patient therapy is effective uh, at solving pathologies related to mucosal atrophy and pelvic support follow-up to confirm our primary impression and encourage more prospective studies. Uh, basically, this is the video. I mean, if... If we okay, are this is not running. No. This, no. Is running. this is the basically video I have made, uh, like how the machine is working. No, it's not running. Yeah, this is my one of patient from UK, and uh, that that is her testimonial regarding this okay. use of my post is technical patient, and she came from UK for with little. Oh, uh, hello, uh, today, uh, is with us. Uh, uh, she underwent a uh, total laparoscopic hysterectomy with me around five years back. Now she came from London, a uh, little bit history of cis urinary incontinence and uh, little uh, other things related to their uh, routine life. Now she will discuss her uh, like uh, experience with us with the help of this uh, laser, vaginal laser, like how she got her experience. She will explain you a little bit. Uh, First of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Remy and uh, actually I want to tell her that she's got 10 for me and uh, I have been, uh, I think, back to my normal life after my surgery, what she had done for me. And, uh, but I was having a bit of issues uh, with uh, my urinary, uh, 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 yeah, I used to feel it's a, uh, uh, light bladder, and then uh, there was a bit of issue in uh, uh, your trochaeus section, I call it. Yeah, in uh, the uh, yeah, trochaeus section, right, I can say. And uh, first time when I went for it, so I felt that uh, it was much better, comfortable, and painless. Yeah. And uh, I feel that uh, young ages we go through mental complexities. So this uh, laser treatment. And uh, another uh, PRP, right? 
So, hello friends. Uh, today, uh, Harman is with us. Uh, the issue is, you know, uh, you have to cater yes. to the H1 yeah, in uh, the uh, RTP section, right, I can say. And the uh, first time when I went for it, so I felt that uh, it was much better, comfortable, and painless. Yeah. And uh, I feel that uh, a young age we go through medical complexities. So this uh, laser treatment and uh, another uh, PRP, right? So now we come for the discussions. Now, Rimi, I think that was good, but the thing is, it's just the start of the, our uh, work, experimental work, which is there, but the studies have been there in climacteric also, and they are also now reporting the positive results. Though I think the stress incontinence has to be a minimum sort of a thing. Uh, but I have just uh, published one article in Journal of Midlife Health, uh, that is from India only, where they have shown the picture, a previous cystocele, a small one, but that improved after this high food therapy and RF treatments. And even one with the UV also. But we cannot give 100% assurance. Not the one, but the initial ones, very small ones, perhaps they get, because basically it's a neocollagenesis. So tissue is there, elasticity is there, Thermal effects are there, uh, thickening of the tissues is also there. So all these things, at least the thermal effect is going to have some positive results, maybe not the 100% as compared to the cost, I think. I think the presentations have been very good, starting from Dr. Humeran. Uh, why they have written, name is wrong, Nori, Norian, they have written, Nori, Nori. I keep on forgetting the names. That is the main problem. Rimi Singla and um, from Nepal, Dr. Tarun, Dr. Chanil from Sh uh, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. Our uh, I call her Nargis because she looks like Nargis only. <laughs> she gave a nice presentation and it was wonderful interacting with all of them. The main carry home message is Genitourinary syndrome of menopause is a condition which has to be recognized, which has to be diagnosed. It is one of the unspoken problems of the women with the life expectancy increasing. They will be fee feeling, uh, facing more of these problems. But why should we women face them? We have to bring them, we as women have to bring them out of their cupboard and start talking about it. In our public forums, we should start talking about it. I think when we come to um, Pakistan for say farms conference, let's have a public awareness program there. Yeah, this is a good idea. That because yeah, we should have a public is... awareness program where we should discuss all the menopause uh, problems. Please invite your women from all the, uh, your women clubs, your other NGO organizations, have a good gathering of the women there. I think that is one thing because then the media is also going to cover it. So this is the high time. We should start doing something positive for the women from the platform of say, farms also. And of course, we are going to activate our relations with the um, uh, local menopause society. Dr. Saida has left because she is our president elect. So we have to, uh, anyway, Dr. Alia Bashir, please give Dr. Saida my I message to have I a public awareness forum uh, during say, farm sessions. Because that's going to be very successful and all the senior faculty should be sitting there on the stage and the public can ask questions openly or you can get their questions initially from them and then at that time they can be added there. So yeah, I think I all said and done, it was a good. Dr. Uh, Alia Bashir, please give your comments. It was a wonderful presentation by all speakers on a very important topic that we actually need to not only discuss, as uh, Dr. Melinda said, but we also need to in, uh, involve the females of the society and the general public so that they can come up with their problems. And the diagnosis is basically uh, on the clinical ground and rather than on certain investigation. And we uh, should uh, continue to ask from the patients that what they are suffering from 
and uh, they need to come up with their problems. Once we will give the, give them the confidence, obviously, obviously we will be in a position, better position to treat them. And the treatment options uh, starting uh, right from the local to the hormonal and the non-hormonal treatment and energy devices, all are available. Now it is up to the uh, doctor's choice as well as the patient's response that what actually we are going to pick and uh, choose for the particular patient and how the patients are going to benefit out of all this. This again depends on the patient's response. Thank you so much. Uh, for Okay then. So we say good night now. We end good the night. program. But before that, we have to thank uh, our partner, Jackson Paul and Nari for giving us continuous support, uh, unflinching support from Deepika. Without her, I won't be able to do this webinar series. She's so much helping along with their approach, the technical support, which is there. But at the personal level also, she gives me a very strength. She's my the... Uh, one of the pillars of my strength is uh, Dr. Deepika. So I thank you from the core of my heart and you please share your slides which you want. Yes, to. Thank because you so much. Products are really good, but I don't think they are available in Sephong's countries. No, I don't think so. But then... Uh, Take them available. Yes, yes. Sure. That is another step along with her unspoken problem. We have lots of needs for these products related to menopause practice, which we will be requesting pharma companies to come forward in all the Sephams countries and have their uh, outlets there. In fact, ma'am, Lycored is one product on which a clinical trial was done by our Indian Menopause Society in yes. menopausal women across India from 17 different cities. And it was a study which was initiated by Dr. Meeta Singh of uh, Indian Menopause Society when she was the president. And uh, it was on the cardio protection and bone protective effect of Lycored, which is there for the osteoporosis prevention and uh, good uh, heart health uh, for the women. So uh, we also have Lycored syrup, which is uh, sugar free. So it can be taken by the uh, di diabetic patients. Uh, we have Verena, our nano silver vaginal gel, which is the first time in India that it is a gel which is working on, you know, re-epithelization. It has pro-healing effect and multiple microbial infections also. It is going to, you know, solve the problems of multiple infections. So we have one solution that is Verena. It comes in a tube. And uh, Didrogestron, our uh, fully indigenized, micronized Didrogestron, which is the API of our own uh, company. And it is the API and the formulation, which is indigenous, made in India, and very good quality, micronized Didrogestron, 10 mg tablets as Divatron. So thank you all so very much for this. Uh, and my thank you to, again, all the faculties which have been there from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from Sri Lanka, from Nepal, and from India also.